everybody. My name's Eugene Novotny. I'm professor of music at Cal Poly Humboldt. We're here in Arcata, California today, and I have the pleasure of talking with my friend, Dr. Ray Holman here from Trinidad. I'm gonna ask him a few questions about the steel pan art form. We're all gonna experience Ray's answers here. So Ray, first thing I wanna say to you is thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure for me to be here too. You know, we got a long-standing relationship together yes. here now. We were figuring out something yeah. like 33, 33 years. years. Yeah. That's, That's a couple that. of years yes. there, man. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that you're willing to answer a few of these questions. Yes. And, uh, man, it's like we've been talking about this casually, but the very first question I'm going to ask is, is basically around something we've both seen happen in these past few years, you know, with the passing of many of the founders. Mm -hmm of the steel band movement worldwide and, and their accomplishments and what they've all achieved, you know, the steel pan art form, kind of moving into a new generation of development. So I'm gonna ask you a couple questions about that. The first one being, what has been, in your opinion, the most important contributions of that founding generation to this art form? Well, their contribution enabled the steel band to be at the point it is now. <clears throat> we had brilliant tuners, brilliant arrangers. You being one of them. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people who explored the gamut of creativity with it, like the steel, like the pans, the stands, sorry, you know, because when I started, I played, there were no stands. You play with this strap around your, pan around your neck with a strap. So people came and brought in stands that we could roll, or you could place the pans upon because you wouldn't have to play them on your, on your lap, you know, because it wouldn't vibrate as, easy, as well as if you to understand. So these people were really, really into it. And they were into it for the love of it, I would like to add that. For the love of the whole art form and the instrument and to take it to a higher level than where they met it. And I think that should be the aim of everybody who is involved in it, you know. You meet it at a certain level and you try to take it as far as you can and you pass the baton and then somebody takes it higher. That's how it is. So that's, I think that they were, they, they were very, very important to us and People like you are helping to make them live through interviews like this, where people might not have realized all the important contributions. You know? So I think this is fantastic. Well, I'll tell you, man, it's like it's, I think of any student here at Cal Poly Humboldt or any steel band across the United States, probably across the world today. You walk into a steel band, you couldn't imagine uh, the instrument not on a stand. You couldn't imagine that. Hmm. I tell some of my students to strap that thing around their neck and play <laughs> it. They're going to look at me in some serious disbelief and think I'm joking. Yes, so many yes. people don't know that's a part of the history of this art yeah. form. I see that picture of the old, uh, the Trinidad All-Star Percussion, All-Steel oh, Percussion steel. Orchestra, yeah. TASPO, mm -hmm. with the pans on their laps. Mm -hmm. and. You show that picture to the students, they think it's posed that way. I'm like, they play it that way, you know? And yeah. you were there to see all that. So, yeah. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. so that's, a, that's interesting, you know? So w with that being said, I mean, all respect to the founding generation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's a, you say in your passing the baton, that's a pretty heavy baton to take in your hand right Definitely. there because, you know, we're talking about people who dedicated their lives oh, yes. and didn't just say they were dedicating mm -hmm. their lives, they actually dedicated their lives to it. Um, you know, again, Ray, you being one of them, you know, and, uh, you know, so with all respect to that, what do you think is the most crucial future development that the worldwide steel pan community needs to accomplish to propel and advance the art form 
towards the future. Now that we're taking the baton, where does it need to go? I'm not exactly sure, <coughs> but I can think that we need to use technology. And I see some of the modern players are trying to use technology, for example, like you remember we had that, that program with Pan for the World or something like that, and they recorded in different places. Oh, yeah. And put it all together. Pan in <laughs> Unity. Pan in Unity. That was a wonderful thing. See, so the technology, use of technology is important. I think we fell down badly there. You know, well, you know, every era is different. Money was scarce in those days, so people couldn't even think about doing anything like that. And I think also we have to pay more attention to recording. That has always been my beef that not much, not enough attention was paid to how we record the steel band and to promoting rep works that were recorded. So we, again, it's a problem, it's a question of marketing and marketing takes money. So just as people like Mr. Triller had invested in steel drums, right, to provide it to you. I think we need people to invest in recording. So the instrument can be properly recorded to take its place. When you put on a steel band record, it mustn't sound inferior to a recording of, of brass or, or, or piano or anything like that, or strings, you know. Mm -hmm. We must be able to, to stand on the same level with them. And this is only possible if a lot of work and emphasis and love of it. I've met engineers where, you know, you go to play band and say, they just hook up the mic and play, you know. They're not really interested in the song you're getting, or they're not willing to experiment with the song. And one ex ex exception is I, went, I played at the World Cruel Festival in Dominica. Mm -hmm. in 2000, sometime, 2006, seven. And I played with a group, the keyboard player in the group had a studio. Now, I was scheduled to leave, let us say, a Wednesday morning. So Tuesday, he called me, said, would you mind coming into my studio before you go for your flight? What time is your flight? I said, yes, I will have a couple hours, you know. And he sat up there, and he had me play, and we were testing how I strike the drum, how far the mic is from the, from the pan. And he really was very scientific in it. I don't think I could find it in Trinidad, mm. <laughs> you know. So it's the question of the interest, the motivation, and the love of the instrument. And the pride, you see, I, I think we need to take more pride in it, you know. And if we, if, we, if we were to do that, well, the sky is the limit. But we must try our best to put it on a, a higher footing, more technical footing, sounder scientific principles to be applied to it. And we need people to help with that. We need finances to help because these things are not cheap, you know. So we need that, we need the help. That's uh, really interesting, you know, <laughs> because, I mean, I think just about everybody in this art forms had the experience of mm -hmm. even, now even, if, let alone recording, showing up to a live gig where you're gonna be amplified. Right. And somebody has no idea what yeah. the instrument's supposed to sound like. And they're the person who's kind of shaping your sound. Yes. And uh, that's really interesting, Ray. I mean, I remember taking a recording class a long time ago when I was a student, and I remember something that the teacher said, and, and there, they said something, we were talking about recording orchestras mm -hmm. and the techniques of recording symphony orchestras. He was speaking specifically about this label, Deutsche Grammophon. Right. And they're, uh, recording engineers mm -hmm. and he said something he's like well the most important thing is that the engineers who are recording that orchestra they love orchestral music and they've been to a lot of concerts they know what those groups sound like right. in the best halls in the yes. world yes. can you imagine if the person recording your steel band had that kind of expertise it's, it's amazing. Well, I mean, that, it would make a tremendous difference. But you mentioned that word that I said before, uh, love. You have to love what you do. You know, and uh, too often I find that 
some engineers, they're just doing it as a job, you know, they're not, they're not really into the instrument or they're not taking the time to find out what, rich, what it should sound like and what it could sound like. So we have a long way to go, a long road to travel, but we'll get there, you know, step by step. That's a really <laughs> interesting answer to that question, Ray. Um, you know, I, you know, you brought up the pan in unity and the, all the recordings done around the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, you know, credit the people who were behind that. I think it was Tracy Thornton mm -hmm. and Yuko Asada <laughs> and Mia Gormady <laughs> Benjamin who yes. were kind of spearheading that. And um, that was a phenomenal, that was a phenomenal project. And you know, it was spawned, I think, in part due to COVID and all the isolation yes, we all yes, had. Yes. So COVID did do something good. Co COVID <laughs> did a couple of things good and a lot of things not so good, you know. But uh, but uh, I, I would just, I was thinking now how I hope that things like that can continue yes. into the future. Sometimes it takes a drastic situation to shake you up into trying new things. And I know a lot of people that started taking recording more seriously, video more seriously, mm -hmm. and so on, because uh, during that period of time when we were all isolated, mm -hmm. it's all you had. So, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. I would hope that things like that continue. And uh, man, I really appreciate your answer, you know, and I will say, I can't, you can't even always blame the sound engineers, especially mm -hmm. for the live gigs. Some of these people do absolutely love music mm -hmm. and love what they're doing and have outstanding <laughs> equipment or the best that they can afford. They just haven't been exposed to the art form mm -hmm. to know. And, uh, you know, so hopefully this, hopefully this will move in that direction. But, uh, man, I think we all got story, <laughs> stories about that. Yes. and. and a lot of them are that good. Horror stories, too. <laughs> I have some horror stories. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us have those, you know, and a couple of good ones. But uh, I appreciate that answer. So I'm going to move on a little different direction here. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, I consider you one of the founding, you know, founder, mm -hmm. founding fathers, really, of the modern steel band world. Mm -hmm. Your original panorama composition, Pan on the Move, propelled the steel band art form into a new era mm -hmm. by inspiring others to follow your footsteps and write their own original music. Yes. And now you are known worldwide for your original compositions for steel band. So that's, that's in the history books already right, right there. Yes. Um, how has the creation of an original repertoire for the steel pan influence the development of the steel pan art form from what you've seen? From what I've seen, <laughs> the original music <clears throat> created amongst the, the body a certain pride. At first, most people were hesitant. Anything new, you know, people are hesitant about it and reluctant to try it. But when it came on stream, people embraced it with a pride and it caused a feeling of, of worth. You know, we felt that we were worth something. Previously, we were just imitators, but now we're worth, we, we are now creators. And I think it, it went, it spilled over into the Calypso, whereby a lot of Calypsoans who were just writing songs like for human politics and so on, your political agenda. Pan and the move opened their eyes. But we, but we could try something too. You know? We could try. And that's when Shadow came around, you know? And it also, the era of, of uh, new instruments. Rudolf Charles, he was creating new the new instruments. After Ellie, the father, had laid down what we know as the basic things. Rudolph was adding little touches to it, you know. Uh -huh. So I think all of that, it, 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 was, it, it made people think more creatively. Well, we could do this because th that was a big thing. I mean, I was criticized heavily for it. I, I don't mind that, you know. But uh, it did give an impetus to tuners too. 
to try to, to excel, you know, to make the pan song truer, to make them more sparkling. And all in all, I think it, uh, it did a good. It did a good. And I hope it would continue. I hope it would continue. You know, sometimes you were saying things, you bring things and then they drop off. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't like to see, I'm, I'm seeing now a little drop off, at least in, 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 in Trinidad, not in the United States. So I think that uh, we have to keep, keep at it. Aim high, you know, aim high and keep innovating and, and trying to push, push in the envelope. Mm -hmm. I would say that, push in the envelope. And the tuners, you know, one, one, what I had observed that from that time, <coughs> that the tuners and arrangers were coming together, you know, to, you know, the tuner would ask you, what kind of song do you want, you know? Right, this tune is your tune. How would you like it? What, how would you like the Panther song, you know? So I think we need more of that, a collaboration between the person writing the music or creating the music and the person creating the instrument. So we have a nice synthesis there. And I think that's the way to go. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the influence has been immense, you know, and, and it has, as you said, spilled over into all these other areas, yes. you know. I want, every time I think about Pan on the Move, I remember, and I think this is well documented now, you've said it in some other interviews, you've certainly told it to me that, you know, you had to get permission Yes. To do your own tune. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You think the only reason that they let you do your own tune is because they thought you couldn't do it. They thought I couldn't write a good one. <laughs> they said, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Give the fool enough proof, he will hang himself. <laughs> oh, my God, man. Yeah. Little did they know. Yeah. They underestimated that one by yeah, a so. mile, yes. you know. Yes. By and a... it made me more determined of course. to produce the best I could produce. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so they really did me a favor. <laughs> they did you a favor, man. That's a good favor yeah. right there, you know. Uh, so, you know, you kind of answered this already, yes. but if you could expand on yes. this, yeah. again, about original music, mm -hmm. what significance do you feel like the development specifically of original music will play in the future of this art form? Now, you said you see it dropping off maybe a yes. little bit yes. in some areas, mm -hmm. not in others. Mm -hmm. um, what's, your best, what's your best prediction sure. for the future? I think eventually it will return. Original music will return. But it needs help from the public from the radio stations, from the media on the whole, you know. And you're speaking of Trinidad. In Trinidad, I'm speaking now. Swift, no, then I'll be going to abroad. Mm -hmm. So I think there we really need it. Because, you know, what's more refreshing than hearing a new piece of music? You go to a concert, you're hearing all the tunes that you know, and you hear a couple that you never heard before. So right away, it's supposed to capture your imagination. You think, wow, this is something refreshing. And I think that some of the <coughs> arrangers who would want to be composers would be brave enough. You see, it, it, it all comes down to some people are afraid to fail, you know. But I don't think about failure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I feel I dust my pants off and come back again. There you go. Yeah, so I'm not afraid, of, but a lot of people don't think like that. And I also see the coming together of the steel pan with the strings. You know, there's a whole new, a whole world open to that. Your pan and the violin, you know, and then people start writing music now for both. See? So I, I'm seeing that's where, that, that, that's where it could go. So the, the concert, in the area of concert, the concert hall, the possibilities are limitless. If we would embrace, if we would be brave enough and embrace the opportunities that will present themselves to us. And well, abroad, United States, to me, you know, sometimes it's sad to say it. But I find that people in the United States, musicians, and to me, they're more interested 
you know, they're more interested in the instrument and finding out about it and exploring. I mean, look at how many great improvisers the United States has produced, right? From Andy Norell coming down all the way down to Victor Provost. And because they took it seriously, and one of the things that you all don't have the disadvantage of is the competition. Mm. You see, the, the, format, the, the competition where you have a judge. and So we got stuck into that. <coughs> and people were so, got so preoccupied with it that they forgot that there are other things in music. I'm not saying not to have the competition. I'm saying you have to be aware. This is not the be all and end all of your musical existence. So I'm seeing in the United States that people seem to be freer. They're less afraid to try mm. something new, you know? They're, they're less afraid to explore than we are back in Trinidad. So hopefully, this, anything could change. You know, you just have to have the willpower. You have to have the will. Do we think it could be better? It should be better? Well, if you say no, well, then there's no further. You ain't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> So the thing is, they look at it critically and think, if could we improve? Is this where we want the steel band to stay? Is it this? Is this the pinnacle, or we think there's more to come? And I personally think there's much more to come. We just have to have what we lack: music schools. See, college student here could go to music school and the period of his, his improvement would be fast, he would improve at a faster rate because we learned, I learned from trial and error. You know. I couldn't read music. My parents didn't have money to send me to, to music class. So I learned the hard way, but I didn't give up. You know, I, I tried to train my ear and, and to learn as much as I could possibly learn from listening, to, from listening to good music. You know. and it was a battle, but uh, I'm glad I'm glad I engaged in it. It I was think painful. A lot of people are glad <laughs> you engaged in that one, man. Yeah. It was painful, you know, as you know, when you're playing it over, let me hear that, let me hear that note, that chord, you know, because I didn't know anything. I didn't know. So I think we, with the benefit of, 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 of music schools, <coughs> everybody should avail yourself of the possibility, of the opportunity, the possibility to improve, and the opportunity to learn and grow. I think that's the future, you know. We, 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 we wouldn't go very far without that. How many people are going to do what I did and take that time to go through that, you know? I you mean, know? time is scarce now. <laughs> time has never been more scarce, scarce you know? It's thing. like uh, <laughs> this whole, I mean, we're fighting that even in the music schools, Ray. Yes. I mean, you know, there's so many options these days mm -hmm. of how to spend your time. And there's so much uh, instant gratification mm -hmm. available through devices, yes. instant access to information, mm -hmm. instant access to things you actually have to get out of your house and go see before. Yes, yes. Now you don't have to. So that's an interesting one right there. Um, like I said, I, I for one, and I think many, yes. are very glad you spent the time. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, you Thank know, you. I'm not forgetting what you just said right there mm -hmm. because that is, you know, we talked about love and dedication before. It's going to take both of those things to do what you did. Yes. You know, so I know, I know that that's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's move on to the yes. next topic here. And you, you keep setting me up to go on to these next <laughs> questions because you bring something up that leads right down the road to where we need to go. All so, right. you know, you travel the world promoting steel band music, teaching the steel band art form, and especially you spent a lot of time in the United States um, working with universities and community steel band programs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just to like document it, when and where was your first experience with steel pan education in the United States? And then what was that experience like? What was the education mm. level like? And what struck you most about that experience? I think it was in 1990 <coughs> at NIU. Northern Illinois University. Northern Illinois University, University when uh, I think I played a concert there. Al O'Connor was the head at the time when Cliff was... Uh -huh. with him, Clifford you know? Alexis, Alexis. Is we were talking about there. Clifford Alexis, my friend 
from Trinidad, a brilliant tuner and player and composer and arranger. So that was my first experience. Now, I had been two years to play, I had been to, to Winnipeg, Canada, mm -hmm. to set up a program there for the University of Manitoba. But in the States, that's night was the first time. And when I saw what was going on there, to me it was something unbelievable because we, I wasn't thinking along those lines. I didn't have, I couldn't envision that this is where steel would <laughs> reach into university campuses and so on, people learning music and reading music from the, reading the scores and so, you know. I couldn't really, I, that, I couldn't envision that. So it was a shock to me. It was a rude awakening that we had to really now get our act together. Mm. You see, it, it, that's how I thought of it. Mm. And I, I remember uh, many years later when Cliff and I went to the University of Arizona to play a concert. Mm -hmm. And while we were, ch we were chatting with a gentleman after rehearsal, and he said, uh, he said, just now you're all going to be like dinosaurs. <laughs> I said, well, he said, because you know the time will come and people, would, people wouldn't be able to spare the time to learn by rote. So you all be like dinosaurs. So when, he, when the man left, I said, Cliff, I ain't going to be no dinosaur. <laughs> 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 I have to do something. Oh. And Eugene, you were so helpful in getting the music scored, you know. You transcribed it, a lot of it, and encouraged people to, 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 to do so. And that was something, that, that was an eye-opener when I saw NIU on the professionalism and the discipline, too, mm. you know. And the applique, all the students apply themselves, and they're willing to know they ask a lot of questions. And that's one thing I learned in the United States. Students ask a lot of questions. Always, <laughs> always. <laughs> but that's fine because they want to learn. And you know, when you answer questions, you, you understand the topic better. It's like a teacher. When, when I used to teach high school, I became more knowledgeable of what I was teaching. So the students, you keep, you know, keep you on your toes and keep your memory going, you know. And in Trinidad now, you know, a, a lot of students come to my home. They attend universities and, and they come and they ask me if I could review their work and help them. I say, sure. Well, how much, will, how much, how much would it cost? I say, it didn't cost you a thing. I want you, if you want you serious, don't waste my time. Yeah. <laughs> if you come to my home and I give up my time, and you have to be serious about it. If you just come in just to, to learn something and then you're gone, no, 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 I, I can't waste time. At this time of my life, every minute has to come. <laughs> so as I went through <coughs> the various states, so I started off in Illinois, then I think we went to Arizona because Janine Remy mm -hmm. was there, you know? Right. And we, I went to Idaho. And I started to go all over the country. Then I came, you, you were such a good patron to me, Eugene, in 1991. Right. We came out there and we used to have summer arts. <coughs> Eugene, I don't know what to say. Your role in this is a tremendous one. Tremendous. Because I've seen what you have done. Uh, Mr. Uh, from Akron, Dr. Snyder. Larry Snyder, yeah. Al O'Connor. These people lifted the steel band. You all, you all actually lifted it up and spread it to the U.S. You know. I appreciate you saying that, but I just look at it <laughs> and I, I was in the right place at the right time and I knew the right people. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's what I was yes. in with me. Yes. I was just a fan. Yes. I was just a fan, but you know, uh, I appreciate you saying that, and I do think that um, there's so many others oh, yes. that have caught this bug yes. and have done so much for this art form, mm -hmm. you know, across. But I did not really fully realize that when you came here in '91, man, it's like you were fresh coming to the states at yes. that point. You handled yourself pretty well, Ray, yes, yes. from well, the word you. go. Thank you know, you. thank you, Willie. See, I didn't uh, want to feel. <laughs> <laughs> to me, as I say, you know, I, I don't think about failure. So I just try and do everything the best I could do it. Mm -hmm. And then Tom Miller had, had come to <coughs> Trinidad and I met him there. And he played. And 
he said he was from Ohio. I said, wow. And then as I began to call over the, wherever I could meet somebody from Ohio, you know? <laughs> I, met, I met a steel band player and a ranger. And well, Cliff had been in Illinois, but before he was in Minnesota. Right. So the Midwest to me was like a cradle, you know, American cradle of the steel band. Now, in New York, we chat from the audience and Korean people and playing pan there, that was a big thing there. But for it to spread all over the country, people like Cliff and Ellie tuning pans going all over because they had to have instruments. The steel band can't spread without instruments, you know. So that struck me as something, when people were criticizing why Ellie, people like Ellie and Cliff were, were sort of sharing the steel band with foreigners, but you had to do it. It can't just remain in Trinidad. Trinidad is a small place, 1.4 million people. So you live in a whole world, you're sacrificing a whole world, and music is all right. So the piano is not all over the world. The guitar, the drum set, the flugelhorn, the trombone, the, the, the marimba, which you play. <laughs> so I, I never thought like that. I always thought that they were doing a great thing and it would benefit everybody. And it has, everybody has benefited from it. Everybody has benefited from that spreading. I, I said I was spreading the gospel of Pan. I looked at it like that, spreading the good news. And they were building the instruments and going all around. I went up in Seattle, I saw Pan up in Seattle, in some remote parts of the Northwest. I went on to, uh, I went to Alaska, Fairbanks, I see Pan there. I went to Hawaii, I see Pan there. <laughs> Wherever you the length and breadth, I was over the length and breadth of the US and this really captivated my imagination. And man, I say I have to, I just have to try and <coughs> do more music to, to, fill, to, uh, to supply this market, you know? And what, what impressed me too, was that they were not only young people, but there were people in their 60s and 70s who were learning to play and playing these. I mean, there was a festival in Maine. And it was amazing, Eugene. People, you know, I said, whoa, in Trinidad, you want to tell a 70 year old woman to come and learn to play pan? She said, no, nah, I am a old woman, I can't play pan. But so the, 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 <coughs> the attitude, the mind, everything is in the mind. And if you think that you can't do it, well, you wouldn't do it. So it spread all through the US, and wherever I went, I saw the improvement. Until today, now it's fantastic. NIU, and Northern and Illinois, under, uh, under Liam Teague now, they, they give several scholarships to Trinidad young musicians. And that. I mean, it started under uh, uh, Cliff on Al O'Connor, but Liam continued it, and like it's getting, it's growing. And this is what you want. You want people to be educated. The educational part of the pan cannot be neglected. See? So as f wherever I, I said it, I imagine I, I went in Mormon country and I see steel man. <laughs> so I mean, I went up in the Dakotas, Cliff, I mean Eugene, up in the Dakotas, and it boggled my mind. See, wait a man. So what I want to do now is, back in trend, I want to go to the remote areas, you know, hmm. and build them a little bit, give them encouragement and whatever I could teach them, if they're willing to learn, you know, <coughs> because I, I see where we need to do this. We need to have it all over. I was just in Grenada. It has spread there a lot too, you know, and that is a country I think that's really taking it seriously, an island. So we just got to put our thinking caps on and do the best we could do. We can't just sit down and say, yeah, we have pan. No, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. We are known as the mecca of the steel band. <coughs> and sometimes I wonder if we really justify that name. Mecca is supposed to be the height, the pinnacle of it. Not so you go to Mecca in Saudi Arabia, you go to, you go to worship, that's it. Can't go further than that. Hmm. So I think we have to really, really work harder to justify that label. I tell all the young players that. You have to work harder. 
you have to do more. You have to be more disciplined. You have to study. You can't achieve anything if you don't study, you know. Study is gone here. <laughs> you have to study, study the instrument. Study music, how to make nice music, you know. And I, don't, I, I think we have the talent. What I think is that, that talent doesn't always have the support. People might think they're supporting it, but sometimes, you know, you know, they say, well, you know what they say about the road to hell? It's people with good intentions. Sometimes people <laughs> feel they're doing good, but they're not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have, to make, you have to make people try to get them to be motivated, to want to play the instrument, and for the right reasons too, for the right reasons. I'm seeing it like hustling is like a hustle for some people. And that is one thing I could say about Ellie Manet and Bertram Kelman and, and, and Leo Coca and those tuners. You know. They were not hustling. Lincoln Noel and those great tuners, you know, they were, they were doing it to the best of their ability. But we know money has crept in. You need money to live. All of us need money to live. But in your craft, I think the primary motivating factor should be to be better at what you do. I, I am, I'm, I'm not compromising on that. Try to be better at what you do. And then you will get you'll reap the rewards. Maybe you want to put the cart before the horse. Yes. <laughs> I can see that. I mean, you saying so much in that answer there, I'll tell you, a couple of things that come to mind is, you know, you saying, you know, everywhere you go in the world, you see the guitar, you see the piano, you see the, it's everywhere. And you made me think, I mean, I've been around quite a bit myself. Every yeah. place I've been, I, I find a piano there. Yes. Every place I go, somebody's playing a guitar or mm -hmm. an instrument like that. And it's a, you know, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful vision to have. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you're calling these names and crediting people, you know, and, and you know, talking about how some people are withholding and other people mm -hmm. are sharing, sharing, you know. From yeah. what I've seen in the United States, I, it, one of the things I admire most about Ellie Manette and what he did with especially the University Tuning Project when he mm -hmm. set it up in Morgantown mm -hmm. is, he trained the next generation of tuners in this country yes. and really around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many of the people that are now that this founding generation of Cliff and Ellie have, mm -hmm. you know, moved on. Mm -hmm. You know, those tuners who are doing the majority of the work in the United States, you know, were really trained by Ellie through his, uh, his vision of sharing the art form. And, yes. I mean, I will never forget the first time I went to Trinidad was 93, playing with you and the yes. hummingbirds up in yes. St. James. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I had been around Cliff. I had been to workshops with Ellie Minette. I had seen these people try to exp exp answer every question about yeah. tuning that anybody ever had. I go to Trinidad. I walk up on the hill mm -hmm. where the pan tuners tune in the pans. Yeah. And he instantly stops and <laughs> try, try, you know, yes, yes. tries to hide what he's doing. Yeah. And I just had to look at him with a little bit of disbelief. And, and I said, you know, I, I'm just coming up here to say hi. Yeah. I, I've been around this before, you yes. know, but he would not, right. he would not tune a note when I was standing there. And I respect that. Mm -hmm. um, in a certain way, I respect it. I mean, who am I? Mm -hmm. And I'm a stranger. Why? Why should anybody? Tr why should anybody trust me? Mm -hmm. Who doesn't know me? Yeah. But it was an attitude I had not encountered Good. in the United States um, because of the people who I was around. Who, as you said, whose main goal mm -hmm. was to share this art form with others. And I'll tell you what, Ray, that's something you did from the word go. I mean, um, you know, we've. We've done a lot of workshops together here in the States. We've done a lot of work and mm -hmm. I've seen you spend so much time uh, with people and the only requirement was they had to really want, want it. Mm -hmm. If you saw in them that they had um, 
that level of integrity, that level of love, and that mm -hmm. they were really trying to learn something, mm -hmm. man, it's like you just, you would give it all, and yeah. you have. So, you know, I respect that so much, you know. Um, so you've kind of touched upon this too. Um, from As an outsider, I look at Trinidad now, and I actually see a lot of uh, innovation, progress, and energy <laughs> put into steel pan education at mm -hmm. uh, at all different levels that I I was not I won't say that I didn't see that I was not mm -hmm. aware of mm -hmm. when I first started traveling down there in the mm -hmm. early 1990s um, where do you see that uh, steel pan education in Trinidad going today do you think that um, things are progressing in a positive way yes it's progressing in a positive way because we have two universities there University of the West Indies and the University of Trinidad and Tobago, who both have PAN programs. I think that uh, we were on the right track with the PAN in Schools project some years ago, but I think it has folded, maybe temporarily. But you need to catch them from young, you know. You need to bend the tree when it's young. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to teach them from young good habits, good techniques, you know. You and I think that needs to be revived. <coughs> I think, I, I don't know what's the reason that it has sort of faltered, but in the higher echelons in the university, yeah, it's fine, you know. So I see, I, and again, I'm just saying on YouTube, and I mean, I guess my most recent trip mm -hmm. to Trinidad was 2020, mm -hmm. and I saw a lot more of the major, the large conventional steel bands mm -hmm. having youth steel band yeah. components. What can you say about that? Yes, a lot of young people have uh, taken it up. Some from the, who are in the pro university programs, mm -hmm. others who are not, but they have friends who are in the programs, so they share an interest, common mm -hmm. interest. So there's a lot, a lot more youth playing. And the only thing is that uh, when the steel man is performing, you see a lot of young people playing, but they don't have any young listeners. <laughs> the audience is not young. <laughs> that is something that I'm trying to, to figure out, you know. Wow. You know, that you have a lot of young people playing the pan, but not many young people come in to listen to it. <coughs> but that they're playing young is fine. <coughs> My wish is that they would be properly taught, you know, that teaching is, is, is the key here now. Teach them the right techniques, the right attitudes, teach them about music, and I think then we could see that We'll, the, the, the programs of the, uni of the universities will be better supported too. Mm -hmm. and, but the youth here, and you know, as I, when I came here, first came here, the fans were young people. I played them as mostly young, you know, young people were my biggest fans, but in Trinidad, it doesn't work like that. Fans are older. So I'm hoping that with all this youth participation you know, that will come some, some young, the audience will get young. We will have a younger audience too. Not with that we don't want a mature audience. I'm saying that we, you, you need both. Mm -hmm. You need both. When I, was, when I started to play pan, we were young. And we had young people pulling, pulling your stands, coming to the shows, with, with mm -hmm. dances and so on. But I don't know what, I don't know what caused the uh, had breaking, I would say breaking transmission. <laughs> hmm. I don't know what caused it. Hmm. I'll have to probably do some <coughs> greater study, you know. But that, that, that takes a lot of time to, uh, to study it clinically and apply scientific methods to it, you know, to get the right answers. I don't want to come with the wrong answers. I answer. mean, that's a, it's super interesting what you're saying, you mm -hmm. know, because I see a variance in age sets in different musics in this country mm -hmm. and um, what you're saying is making me think a lot about some of my travels and experiences. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting. I mean, I think, I'm think i thinking of the classical symphonic orchestra in this country and when mm -hmm. I go to a major symphony concert in a big city, it's mm -hmm. not a lot of young people attending. Yet, I can remember attending a concert in Italy several years ago and you look through the audience and it's like pe person, people of every age at that concert yes. and 
And it struck me at the time that, wow, I don't see that so much here. And um, what you're describing in Trinidad is very interesting to me. Um, man, you got to keep the audience that you have. Uh, yes. But if when you figure that out, I hope you share that with everybody, too. Because <laughs> yes. I, I think, think that's that's I'm going to study it. Too. That's everybody's goal is to mm. is to do something universal enough to mm. where there are no age barriers on yes. how it affects. affects well, in, people, in, you know. in Latin America, you know, what I remember when I was there and I still see it on videos. And so, young and old party together. Mm -hmm. Young and old play music together. Mm -hmm. That's a Latin culture, but Trinidad, young and old playing, but only not young, we have no young audience, as I said, so we have to kind of bridge that, you know, get them to come out, you know, maybe in time, maybe everything is going to happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one, give me this, uh, when they asked Einstein why he was taking so long on his theory, when he was at the British University, the, pro, the, the provost asked him, why you think? He said, because, every, because they invented time so that everything doesn't have to happen at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's supposed to have to be patient. That's pretty good. <laughs> everything doesn't have to no, happen at once, same. man. No, no. That's pretty good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move down to my last kind of yes. area to ask you here today, and that is, um, you know, Again, you kind of set this all up for me, so this is easy right here. You've been around the steel band art form almost your entire life. Mm -hmm. You experienced the development of the art form from the ground level. You in interacted with some of the most important people mm -hmm. in the steel band world. So, I don't know if this is a question that can be answered or not, but what I'll ask is, what do you feel? has been the single most important development in the steel pan art form that you have witnessed in your lifetime? <clears throat> well, as a musician, as a pan player and arranger and composer, I think the creation of the double seconds by Ellie Manet was to me the most important discovery or creation or advance in the steel band world. Now others might come and be more important, but to me that was, that, you know, it, it was like a revolutionary sound. Before that we were playing single bands, right? When I started to play it was one tenor, second single, guitar single, bass single. But when I heard that sound, Gene, I couldn't believe it was a pan. It sounded so beautiful, you know. So, and that, <coughs> if you look, I mean, the double second is played by a whole, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of professional musicians. Could you imagine your band without a double second? You can't, it can't work. It can't happen. So I thought that was a big leap. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm not discussing like, developments in pan, in, in a, and with stands and so on, they were important too, you know, and canopies. But I, I, to me, as a musician, I would put the double second ahead of everything. Ahead of everything. That is a super interesting answer. <laughs> I mean, and again, it takes me back. See, I can't imagine ever being in a steel band without a double second. No, no. And it is probably the most used instrument in most steel bands because yes. you have it doubling as a role of a double second. Yes. Often that instrument's used to play a double tenor role, right. which, you know, develop from yes. a different design. But man, that's an interesting answer. I'm, I'm just trying to put myself, what would it have been like to be around <laughs> yes. when that happened? Boy, I mean, see? That was a momentous occasion when I heard that instrument. I remember where I was at the time. Where were you? You I was in Hunter now. Street. I was in my street, Hunter Street. Hunter Street? <laughs> wow. And I heard it. I was walking up and I heard, you know, it was quiet. It was an evening time and the people had gone home from work. I mean, after six, it was quiet. And I heard this sound and that thing blew my mind, Eugene. Wow. I never imagined a pan with song as, is the beauty of it, you know? Pan instruments might be louder than that instrument was at the time. 
for the beauty of the instrument, I say, no, no, this, this is something uh, <coughs> really, really fantastic. And see, that's the instrument I connect you with the most. Double it's right. the instrument I see you play the most. Yes, so. I fell in love with it. I was a tenor pan player. I won the ping pong solo playing a tenor pan. Right. Pan. <coughs> but double second, you know, the, I started to play double second. As soon as I saw the pan, I started to play it. And uh, Ellie encouraged me to play. See, this is a new, new thing, you know. He wanted people to have to play it because it's a new, it's a new instrument he created. So I was one of the first. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. So you gave me a great answer to that one. So here's the, here's the follow-up. We're not oh shaking just right. yet, buddy. Here's the follow-up question yeah. to that. You don't have to answer it if yeah. you don't want to, but you know, if that's the single most important development, where has the steel pan art form fallen short of your hopes and expectations? I think lack of interest in technology, one, as I said before, mm -hmm. settling for just a What's mediocre in a lot of cases? Not having the drive to take what is ours. This is our thing, you know. This is our thing. Putting your heart and soul into it to take it one step further than you, than you met it. I think many people are not really into that, you know. And I did, there are several theories, <coughs> but I don't want to go and explore, and you know, that'll take a whole long time. But that's something that I'm a little disappointed in, that people don't seem to want to really get to the nitty gritty of things, you know, to get, get down and get your hands dirty, and find out, let's see how we could do this better. <coughs> Not. Well, it was always so. No. Let's see how we, how we could do it better and, and, and advance the entire movement. Put us on a level, as I said before, where we deserve the title of the Mecca. And some people might disagree. I'm just saying what I see. And I think that if the young people <coughs> could be guided in the right direction, they would be the ones to take it further and to fulfill my dreams and hopes of it. But they must be guided properly. You know, teaching is the most important thing. Eugene, you know, you're a teacher, I was a teacher. How do people learn from good teachers? You can't have a bad teacher and learn from the bad way you're learning the wrong things. <laughs> so so the, teaching, the teaching is important. The people who are instructing them and people who are talking to them about music and about, about what the pan could be and what they would like it to be. Some people have good ideas. They're not necessarily pan players or pan musicians, but they have ideas. They could visualize something, you know. You say, you know, I could see the pan doing this and doing that, you know. Well, let those people tap into it. Bring them into it. You, we need to talk to the, to the young ones more. We need to engage them, but then they have to be willing to learn, you know. <laughs> If all they're hearing is something at a certain level and you come in to tell them something different, they look at you with what's man saying, you know. So it has to be a concerted effort to push our thing. Our thing is the most important. Look at it like that. This is always the islands didn't really invent many things. The pan is one. So we should be proud to push it as far as we could take it and not settle. I don't like the settling. <laughs> I don't like the settling either. <laughs> so that's what I would say. Well, that's fantastic. Now we got no, we a shake, shake right here, buddy. Nice Thank buddy, you man. so much, right? My pleasure, man. That was wonderful, yes. dude. See, I th I've known you for so long, and yeah. I still learned something right there. So thank you, man. Thank you so much, we, we Dr. Dr. Ray Holman. <laughs> thank, thank you, Eugene. You. Thank you for inviting me.